Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities around the globe with your hosts. I'm Jason, and we got Travis here as well. Hello, hello. And today we're zooming in and chatting with Ace from Spain. Welcome. Hello, hello. Yeah, this week we're joined by number one worldwide, Ace. Yeah, happy to be here. He just won the Warhammer Warhammer World Fest. Warhammer Fest? Warhammer World, no fest at all. A Warhammer World. <laughs> Warhammer World tournament won security's golden ticket to his yep. second world championships. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we met last year for the first time at the last world championships where he trounced me with Hunter Clay on an in the dark map when I was playing Pathfinder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can I remember that, yeah. Yeah. I think nowadays I feel like the Pathfinders have a little bit better of a chance. <laughs> but back then <laughs> it was a rough match. It was really difficult for them, yeah. Yeah. You know, we wanted to zoom in onto Spain because Spain's got one of the densest, toughest kill team communities with one mm-hmm. of the highest player counts, I think, of all the regions. I think actually at the moment we are the highest uh, at all. Like the 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 community with more games and more tournaments around the world. Which is crazy considering how small is Spain compared Man. to other countries. Yeah, you guys have definitely taken to Kill Team in a much stronger fashion than a lot of the other regions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we are very, very lucky to have this community. Yep. Yeah, but before we jump into you know more serious stuff about the Spanish community, how's mm-hmm, everyone? Mm-hmm. How's everyone doing in their real lives? So we are doing fine. We are uh, now it's uh, summer is ending, so we are going back to work, which is uh, pretty sad. But yeah, we are fine. Yeah, I'm just staying busy over here, uh, trying to squeak in as much time as I can to to keep up with Kill Team, keep playing Kill Team, but it's definitely my ultra busy season at work here. Yeah, we're getting into the, the last two month uh, lead up to New York Open. So I've been now we have to push, I think, the advertising a little bit harder for the New York Open just because we got to get got to get those ticket sales in. So how many players do you have so far? I think right now we're in the low 40s. You know, we're two months out and we'd ideally like to get it a little bit more. So if any listeners are, you know, curious about coming to the New York Open, please sign up. But as far as the Spanish scene, you know, I know you went to Warhammer World, did very well. You've done in the past and done pretty well also. Mm-hmm, yeah. What other Spanish tournaments are coming up? Like how many how many tournaments are you guys doing this month? Because I know when we were talking about setting up this podcast, you wanted you were we wanted you to come on before some of the tournaments. So you could do a little bit of advertising with the tournaments. Not that we have a lot of Spanish listeners, I assume, but mm-hmm. it would be kind of cool for all of our listeners to hear what's going on in Spain. So right now, um, our biggest tournament is coming. It's on the 14th. Let me check one sec. On the 16th and 17th of, of September, it's it is called the Freak Wars, and it's going to be 120 assistant players tournament. So it's going to be, I, we think it's going to be really big. Also, it's uh, like a really big convention. So a lot of shops uh, advertise there, a lot of uh, game systems like Aristella and Infinity, which are Spain, Spanish, sorry, uh, are going to be there. So it's going to be a really, a really fun and interesting um, venue to come. And yeah, and we're having one golden ticket on the line too. So it's going to be definitely really interesting. So it's kind of like the Spanish yearly finale, it sounds like. 120 people sounds like an insanely big tournament for Kill Team. It's going to be really big. Yeah, we have our, actually we have our finals. So our two first uh, golden tickets have been decided on the 15th and 16th of, of August, where was that finals. And one of the players uh, is going to be Java, who brings uh, Charles Cult, who was second with, uh, sorry, third with Charles Cult. And the second is Kikems with or commandos, probably the best or commandos around the world, I think. So both are going to Atlanta. So I I'm really expecting really big things from them on on the states. So I'm really excited to to see how far they can come. So yeah, sounds like those three like your hometown heroes are your top finalists, and then you guys are gonna crown your next one at this 120 yeah. person tournament. How many rounds are you doing for 120 people? Actually, it's going to be six or seven rounds. Okay. Six rounds. So, so there should be a couple undefeated, basically? Only one, actually. Okay, all right. Dang. What are you guys managing? How are you managing the tie situation for these large tournaments? Sorry, the tide? Uh, draws, basically, where two players oh. 
Because draws can basically make a, a final undefeated a little bit harder over the course of a tournament, depending on yes. how, many, how many of those come up. And, you know, for Kill Team Open at In the Dark, it happened all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, going to, it's going to keep happening. So uh, on the last round, the, the round that decides uh, who gets the ticket, you cannot draw. Like, we have um, a system to, to resolve the draws, so it should be no, no, not really a problem. It's like no last... tiebreakers before the final yeah. round. yeah. That's pretty much it. So, yeah. And I know we talked to the Polish scene, you know, a couple episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Compared to the Polish scene, is the Spanish scene as top down where there's like one large organization? I know you're part of MRQ3, but obviously looking at the ITC rankings, there's a couple Spanish teams that float around. And I'm just wondering, is it you and your squad kind of helping to push the tournament scene? Or is it a little bit more grassroots where there's a lot of different scenes bubbling up and there's not really central central leadership, basically? Actually, we have a we make an organization uh, to pay for the ticket. So the golden tickets in Spain are not supported by GW. We pay our own champions, so we pay the travel. So this is a it's it is called Ibericon. So we have our own ranking like uh, ITC, but I think better because the um, the algorithm I think is better right now. So we have our own ranking. Uh, we have uh, all the TOs of Spain together on the same group. So this is a TO organization, the, the Iberic Ibericon, or Ibericon in Spanish. And that's how we get uh, funding. And that's how we are going to be able to send three people to, to the States. Self-funding. So it's going to be pretty good. Pretty cool. Yep. And yours is the only funded ticket, I assume. Mine is, the, yeah. yeah. Because my ticket is from out of the GW. of Spain, yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's from GW specifically. Yeah, I think yes. you know the New York scene also is running that issue. But the New York scene, at least, we're much much closer to Atlanta. So if it's a local player, it's going to be much uh, much much easier on us. Much easier, yeah. So how much does a plane cost from New York to Atlanta? It's like two hundred dollars. Yeah, <laughs> not the same. <laughs> it's okay. Our venues are much more expensive by comparison because we're in mm -hmm. New York. That's true. Yeah. What kind of venues is Spain generally playing in? Are you guys located at local board game shops or larger convention halls? I know you said this 120 person coming up is part of a larger convention hall, but what are your other normal tournaments? Because you guys run 30, 40 person tournaments much more regularly than I think almost any other region. So I'm sure our listeners are curious, you know, what does the what is the Spanish scene playing on? So most of the time is uh, shops, um, Kill Team, oh, sorry, uh, Warhammer shops that have a place to play. We use that, like 20, 30 players are what we use. And if we make a bigger tournament, then we have to ask for, I don't know, um, um, so another, another places like the, for, the, um, for the town hall to, to let us a big place to, to, to make the tournament and something like that. But normally it's like clubs or associations or, or, or the shop it, itself that where we play pretty much. So yeah, every month in Spain is like a 30 or 40 uh, attendant tournament. Yeah, Spain definitely has the run of the tournament scene as far as I think the world is concerned, because you guys have four round, four or five round tournaments very regularly mm -hmm. compared to everyone else. Yeah, so uh, every month pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I think locally, most of my players are like three or four rounds is like, they're like, all right, cool, we're good for the day. We don't <laughs> want to play anymore. <laughs> yeah, three four rounds like, is it tops, yeah. Yeah, but you guys are down to five rounds. You guys start... How early do you start to run a five-round tournament? Sorry, can you repeat that? How early do you guys start in Spain to get your five-round tournaments oh, in? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock to... Nine o'clock to nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> More or less. Yeah, Jason, can you imagine? Yeah, that's pretty gnarly. How long are the rounds? One hour, 45. Very tight schedule down there. Do you guys have wiggle room for round transitions, or is it like everyone is all the way done at an hour and 45 like everything is packed up and ready to move to the next table most most of the time we are we have a uh, 15 minutes to transition to um, rest and, and that kind of stuff uh, but yeah most of the people are ready at, at one one hour 45 minutes to, to go to the other table pretty much seems like a really really hard schedule for how newer players how do you guys basically onboard newer players or are there kind of easier tournaments that progress into these more uh, serious five round tournaments? So for example, in Madrid, that is my, this is my, my region. We have uh, tournaments, uh, afternoon tournaments, which starts at 
eight o'clock in the afternoon or nine o'clock, and then goes until two or three a.m. in the morning. So there you can just have some drinks and relax and have some team games, like three round tournament, and that's it. And then we have tournaments only in the morning, so maybe once per month. We have uh, this tournament that is starting at 10 and ending at uh, thir- th- uh, three o'clock in the in the afternoon. So then you can go lunch to your to your own home. So you have more chill, easier tournaments on both ends of the schedule, basically to allow for whoever to sort self sort newer players into whichever time schedule works easier for them. Yeah, yeah. and then after that, once per two months in Sp- in Madrid, sorry. We have a four rounds a tournament. Actually, five rounds. I think they are not that more appealing. So our big, our biggest tournaments are going into seven rounds, so six or seven rounds, and then the normal ones are are on four rounds. So two days, or if if it's one day, only four rounds, pretty much. Yeah, I think we have a lot of three round tournaments, and then the bonus fourth round is just for the final two undefeated players to go play and finish yeah. out because then you have for the more casual player three rounds is already a lot for yes. juggling juggling all the plates yeah, yeah three rounds are yeah the standard here so they are fine uh, actually rookie people want to play even more like if they like the game they want to play more and they keep asking when is the the next tournament so that's pretty cool yeah. that's very cool yeah so it sounds like the the building of the community is is pretty much built around the tournaments then well Yes, we have um, the community is built around tournaments, but not only. So we have three or four good, really good content creators, and we have, I think, is the biggest Discord out there with three thousand something people, which only Spaniards, which is quite a lot. And we are all around there discussing strategies, uh, talking, uh, meeting new people from from all over Spain. So that's pretty cool too. Yeah, I mean, we've got our own tiny little Discord. I think we're up to like 69 people recently. So that's good. That's we're, we're nowhere near the 3000. But <laughs> I know clo- like locally, I know a handful of players, at least on the East Coast, that have like infiltrated the Spanish Discord just to like hang around, <laughs> <laughs> just to hear what's going on. <laughs> that's yeah. really good to I, hear. I remember last year at the, I think at the World Finals, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of memeing going on on the Discords. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, that happens. <laughs> The yeah. Mimi Wars, it starts on Las Vegas and uh, continues in New Mexico. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it never, it never stops. It never stops. Yeah. yeah. How did you get started in the Spanish community? Were you there from day one or did you come in as you were starting to compete and you realized you wanted to help out the scene a little bit more? So when I started to play Kill Team, it was uh, after COVID, right after COVID. I started playing with my brother just because we have some 40k models. It was uh, the uh, last edition, so not the current one. And we started to play, and then we get into this Discord. And then we start talking, and we really love the game. I start competing from, from day one. So on the first year, after right after the, the release of Kill Team 1, uh, on ITC, number one, number one ITC was myself, and number two was my brother. So that was pretty, pretty cool. And then we keep playing and we try to help the community as much as we can because we enjoy the game and we want to other people to enjoy it. So so it was really a day one, day one effort almost. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Did you do you feel like so you have been running tournaments, but there's other people that have been running tournaments. And you said that you have like yep. a TO organization in Spain that yep. you I assume that you helped found. <laughs> Well, or was that I, effort by led by someone else that you know? I think I won. Uh, I help. I help lead. Uh, I help. Ah, sorry. I help to found it. Yeah, uh, because right now I am. I am the president of this organization. So yeah, I, I was there in the on the day one too. So uh, because I keep getting involved in in everything that is related to Kill Team to make things better. So that's why. But yeah, there is there is like. Uh, the tournament organization were were there before before myself. There was a WhatsApp group, and they get to organize that way before I get into Kill Team, like three or four years ago. Because Kill Team uh, last edition was really strong too in in Spain, so that's why we have a really it's, good base community. 
Yeah, did Spain also have the old guard kind of switch switch to other games when Kill Team Twenty One switched editions? I think um, almost everybody switched to the new edition because the new edition is just better in in every sense. So why not? Maybe not fourteen and its players, but other than that, <laughs> definitely. I think the game plays a lot smoother. There's a lot more action. There's a lot more back and forth compared to the old Kill Team, which. Yep was fun for list building and there was lots of cool things that you, like niche combos basically mm-hmm. but you know i it was much harder for me to onboard a player onto old kill team than it is on this new kill yeah. team. It's, it's way better it's like a way better team way better game sorry and the, the models are so cool on this new kill team so that people get involved so fast yeah the new kill team definitely is way better i i'm i'm just uh expecting a gw release some of some of the Classic Warhammer 40k teams like Tyranids, um, Custodies, etc. Et we will have to wait, I guess. Time will tell. We do have <laughs> hopefully a new release this year. You know, we don't know what exactly what it is, but I'm sure we're all all waiting for it. Do you find that Spain has a lot of players that come in when a release basically updates and they they want to jump in on that specific team? Oh yeah, we have yeah we have um, people coming in waves. So if uh, there is a new faction that is uh, so popular, then we get like a, a big amount of players coming into play. Yeah. So we see that. We saw that. Sorry. So how did the summer go for Spain? Because I know at least locally on the East Coast, I felt like there was definitely a lull in between the May quad team drop and now before, you know, the balanced like data mm-hmm. slate because Chaos Cults and Felgor were such yep. a, a boogeyman for everybody that it, it felt like there was a little slump as far as uh, play trajectory went. I know, Jason, it sounds like you felt a similar vibe, so I'm wondering if Spain had something similar. So it was pretty much the same because the uh, game was a little bit boring with uh, two, get, two uh, teams dominating all the scene. Not only that, a lot of people switched to 40k, to big 40k again because of 10th. And it was okay. It was summer... It was time to spend time with the family and that kind of stuff. But then I think we are going to uh, see uh, a lot of that players coming back because 10th is not that good from what I hear. And the balance right now are pretty good. So I would expect to, uh, them to come back home, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of I'm hoping for a similar thing. Jason, I assume you're waiting for the 10th slump to drop off as well in Minnesota. (laughs) Yeah, and I'm also just kind of waiting for me to work less. Um, We actually, like, we've got two different tournaments coming up in September, um, just kind of like smaller little local ones. Um, I think they're shooting for like 16-ish people for each. And then at the end of November, we're looking to put together like a 24 or 32-person tournament, which should be a fun one. But yeah, I mean, like, the league is still going strong over here, and all the people that were trying out 10th are just like, oh yeah, Kill Team's way better. And, you know, <laughs> I agree. Uh, I've dabbled I've dabbled in some 10th edition, and I'm actually, uh, I'm playing in a, in a 10th edition big 40k league right now as well with the Chaos Knights, so it's kind of like Kill Team, I just bring a few models and stomp <laughs> around, but yeah, Kill Team is... Uh, Kill Team just seems like it's way more skill based and it's way less. Um, like, you can just go pick up a new Kill Team for like 60 bucks and run around and have a good time with it. Also, I think Kill Team captures better uh, the spirit of the of the teams. So, Orc it really does. Orcs. Yeah. Yeah. Way better than Big 40K, I think, right now. I 100% agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, Phobos Marines in 40k are just kind of like plebs and pawns. The the Phobos Marines in Kill Team are actually pretty badass. Like, speaking of which, we've got an operative showdown. Operative showdown. And for the operative showdown, we're talking about Phobos. We're talking about all the different kinds of Phobos Marines. If there's one that you've got as a favorite, um do you like i'm assuming you run a blend pretty often have you done any any like pure teams like pure reavers pure incursors pure infiltrators anything like that um so and i i just tend to mix and max all the phobos because they are they're all important in the in the team 
So you need rivers, you need incursors, and you need infiltrators. So all of do them you, have a place. Yeah. Do you have? Do you find that your team is often dominated by one specific type, or a majority is one type, or are you doing even splits? Because I find that I'm generally running about two reavers most of the time, unless you need a skew matchup where. And the board allows you to do a skew matchup for five reavers, which you know most boards probably shouldn't allow. But mm -hmm. <laughs> on the times where it yeah. happens, there are some niche cases where five reavers are good. So I'm just yep. curious. So most of the time, I run two, 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 but it, it's because I like the specialists more than the um, incursor or infiltrator. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I pick pretty much always river sergeant and river warrior, and then main layer and sniper. And then medic and uh, veteran. That's pretty much my 80 to 90 percent uh, kill team uh, pick. Uh, so I, if you I do swap out a model, which one are you most likely to include and why? Hmm. So sometimes I include the explosive guy, the the, the other oh. infiltrator, the actual um, saboteur, the saboteur. Yeah, and. I, it replaces the mind layer or the medic. It depends. And then I'm assuming that's a matchup dependent. Yes, uh, I pick them. I pick it against uh, milliards, pretty much. So I can threat some explosive uh, news for them. Do you threaten the charge place bomb throw, or basically like move up, place a bomb, explodes on the point, or are you trying to set up over two turns to deny areas when you play that model? So uh, all the things you say are correct. It depends on the on the matchup and on the player. Yeah, yeah. If your opponent is willing to give you five models and a blast, you'll do it. But then it's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you're only getting two, you're not going to sacrifice your saboteur with it. I see. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And because he's an infiltrator, he has like a really good bolter. You can shoot twice with the bolter, and then on the next turning point, plant the mine, and then it's pretty cool. If he was low on goons, and then you explode a one goon marine, for example, then it's super worth. That's actually a very interesting point that you can just use him as an infiltrator gun because the lethal five theoretically is supposed to be very good. Did you run yes. into have you run into issues with the no like lack of rerolls on the team or do you just stockpile yes. CP for that? Yes, like I always pay for them for on turning point two because you need you need some um, some damage deal um, thing to go to go on your way because you you are lacking rerolls. So I always pay for the P1, Border Discipline, and Vanguard. Not always, maybe not on 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 C on Capture, for Vanguard. But the other two are are really key uh, to make some damage. So you you need it. You really need it. And I pay for it like always, pretty much. That's actually so, interesting. I haven't yeah. I hadn't heard about actually using the P1 pretty actively. I know it's been changed a lot. The first buff was that you had to stand still, and now it's just a flat P1. So P1 Lethal Five, Bolter Discipline seems pretty good, right, Jason? Oh yeah. <laughs> It definitely is. Um, so you you said you pretty much use that always. Like, do you even do that on turn one? Not really. I don't use. I played. Uh, I used to play, or I I'm playing really cagey on turning point one, advancing models and just placing the mine most of the time and try to dominate the field with the with the rivers and the terror the terror aura. And that's it. Uh, I don't tend to shot on turning point one unless there is like a really bad building map with. Um, with obscurity, but not cover, pretty much. Yeah. Actually, one thing I just found out recently is that terror is like a very specific wording, or all the abilities that give minus APL require your model to be within three inches or two inches of the objective, but the whole objective gets affected by the minus one APL bubble. Yep. So it's almost like a five inch bubble. So you can actually affect the mid board objectives very easily with terror. Yeah. Actually, I think it's from model to model. Do you check that? Are you sure of that? Yeah. I'm reasonably sure. I will go with you then. But I'm a fact check. My, I'll fact check I, myself right now. Yeah, I think the the legionary, the shrive talon works that way. Um, but the phobos, I feel like the terror tactics is model to model. But if it yeah, if it is to the objective, then that's when I determining control powerful. of an objective marker that any friendly operatives that perform this action during this turning point are within range of. Treat that enemy operatives total APL as one less. Oh yeah, yeah. So then I was, I, I was thinking myself. 
Yeah, so basically, this is actually the... Co I recently found this out, and I did a double take, because I've never played it this way, because I have never thought about it in this way. But the mm. wording is very specific. Gellerpox, Phobos, and Exaction all have control of objective modification, where you give minus one APL on the total ob objective. And it's if you're in range of the objective, everybody gets the minus APL. Is the way it currently looks like it's worded. Is it worded so, differently in the, the Spanish book? Uh, I'm just reading. So for the um, for the mission action is within three of the of the river. Yeah. And but when the second one the... is not. Yeah, yeah, the second one is not. Yeah. So for any listeners who did not know this, because I only just learned this within the last two weeks, uh, yeah, it's a very powerful ability. So the Gellerpox Screamer Hulk, I think, does the same thing, but he's within two of the objective. This one um, is within three. I think, yeah. 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 Yeah, so this, uh, yeah, just just know that the Reaver standing right at the edge does give you minus APL, even if you can't yeah. get to him because he's on the other side. Yeah. And Terror is really good right now with zero AP. Like, really, really good. Yeah, right. I think right now Phobos, or Phobos Reaver is effectively kind of play like a 5 APL model because they're just scaring everything and like guarding. That. And it's also really good uh, that uh, other people need to spend one extra APL to perform the mission action. Because then uh, you can see some of the opponent models, and then you can know that he's not going to be able like to ever reach that that point, and that point is going to be you on yours on turning point one, pretty much. And like if someone uses retrieve item, you just have a reaver run up there and park on the item. Yep. Good day. Good luck. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um. So then, what kind of tac ops do you take? So most of the time I pick uh, Seek and Destroy against Orths or like really shitty models. And I pick Re Recon on against Elites and other stuff. It depends. It really depends. On, on in, Into the Dark, I play more Recon and on Open, I play more Seek and Destroy. But it depends. It depends if I, if I think I can achieve some of the uh, Seek and Destroy tactics pretty much. So have you pretty much been happy with that? Or like, did you have you tried out Infiltration and decided it didn't make the cut? Or what do you think about the Infiltration for Phobos? So the thing with Infiltration is, they are, Infiltration is actually pretty good with uh, our teams, but not that good with elite teams. That's why I don't, I don't think I ever pick it. Like, yeah. they are not really good right now uh, for Phobos. Because you cannot... Um, you cannot be, sometimes, you are not going to be able to score the barricade one, which is the core of the infiltration, uh, tack up deck. So I prefer to stick with the, with Recon. If I want to, if I will play infiltration, I, I just pick Recon pretty much and that's it. Infiltration is much better left to the orcs and the chaos cults right now, it feels yeah. like. Yeah, yeah you have you have extra models to kind of throw away at the edges of the board, whereas Phobos, yeah. you only have six models, so they have the six elite model team where you... If they don't, if they waste an action, you, it's really bad because you only have eighteen actions. Right. Although for Phobos, you know, you got anywhere from twenty four to twenty six based on the, <laughs> <laughs> the model count. Yeah, but and you can score recon like really easy if you want. Yeah. Like secure item is pretty good, and into the dark secure rooms are pretty good too. So also um, like uh, beacon are still good for Phobos with the free mission action. So yeah, yeah. Plant transponder being, you know, yeah, you just got to get more than six inches away from the last one. But for Phobos, yeah. that is almost a given. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. And it sounds like it sounds like they're in a really good spot. It sounds like you've been having. Obviously, you've been doing very well with them. So it's cool to see the two 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 split. When you pick the you you said that you take the veteran most of the time. Are you finding that you have a specific combo you always take? Yeah, and, uh, lethal five plus balance. Yeah, basically this just looking for the rerolls just because you need the consistency somewhere. This is the way, yeah, to play it. Yeah. How many times have you rolled the sniper and actually only gotten two hits? Uh, happens. Actually, in my in my game against Dan, every time I roll uh, for choose, like with the river leader, the river sergeant, sorry, and the sniper, I just roll two choose and two ones, or two something and two ones. And it was like... What's going on? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it happens. It, yeah, it is what it, it is. is. It is a dice game. It's a presidential yeah. game first, but you know, when it comes down to it, the dice, the dice do what they do. Yeah. So, uh, out of factions, uh, mitigate this with rerolls. Uh, Phobos mitigate this with uh, a lot of shooting. 
that's why that that's how you mitigate all the the lagging of rerolls. You just shoot twice, shoot twice, shoot twice. Yeah, increase the volume to make up for yes. the the deficiency. I think that's a good that's a good good hint for everyone. Because mm. I personally, I never actually use bolter system that much, just because I was too focused on maybe the positional play or doing some of the other stuff. Mm. So thinking about actually setting up for a bolter discipline, you know, it's definitely something I haven't really thought about, especially against orcs where. Yeah, the one shooting step is not going to do it, but the second shooting step probably will. Yep. Yeah, you need you need to set up things to be able to shoot twice and then go back to conceal. So you are really easy uh, going into non reciprocal non reciprocal shooting without any effort. Like two shoots, go back to conceal. Two shoots, go back to conceal. So and also, a... you know, do the mission action because you're standing yeah. on a point. Yeah. yeah. While you're at it, yeah. I was kind of functioning similarly. I was running uh, pure incursors. And then just shooting through, obscuring all the time, and no one can shoot back if you just, like, especially with some of those maps that have vantage points where there's heavy cover in the middle, and then all you need to do is see them, and then you can shoot them, and they can't shoot back. And, like, yep. you can, with that with Vanguard, you can get all sorts of shots that people aren't expecting, and you can just, like, hammer people with a ridiculous alpha strike, and then yep. just, like, run out into the middle of the board and die. But you had a yep. strong lead at the <laughs> beginning, and that's how I like to play Phobos. Yeah. So the thing, the thing is, um, with my um, deployment, you have two people that ignore obscures, and you are you are going to need to abuse the the smokes. I really like always pick it, pretty much always I pick a smokes, and that's where they really sign. If if they are able to set up some smokes and you are able to avoid shooting on turning point one, then you are like uh, really into a really good start. Yeah. I've always felt like Phobos, if you have a model die on turn one, is a disaster. It really is. Yeah. 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 Whereas like yeah, Intercessors, yeah. you can maybe recover because they're so tanky that you can kind of, yeah. it's not good, but you can, if you've killed a model or two by the time it happens, maybe it's recoverable. But I always felt like Phobos, losing that first model is so much rougher because you're so much more fragile than your, yeah. your tankier cousins. You are really like on a really, really thin, uh, like a really little line. If you lose more Phobos than you should, then you lose the game because you don't have enough people to do things. So, yeah. yeah. No, those, are, those are all really good notes for Phobos. Yeah, it's cool to hear that, you know, all three of them are getting some use that, you know, Reavers are a big part and that Reaver Sergeant is so critical just because hitting on yes. twos is such a yes. huge deal when you cannot rely on your dice to do anything. Yes, <laughs> pretty much. Yes, yeah, yeah. And and I play them uh, so cagey, like turning point one and two. I try to not lose more than one operative, and then after that, on turning point three and and four, if you have five uh, marines or four marines on turning point four, you can do a lot of stuff because so are you, they are. Are you often um, willing to take a? point differential on turns one and two to keep models alive to chip away no. your opponent's team actually on turning point one because i have smokes and rivers i used to take four to two and then i just i just retreat on turning point two like uh, maybe pick up one or two shots and go back and run okay. for the for my life yeah so you so you are willing to take a, a def like basically yeah. on turn two you're willing to retreat just because yeah. you've done the work on turn one but on turn one because you think that your turn one pressure is so good. You do want to yeah. get out, get the points, and then basically let your opponent swing back, come into range, and then yeah. really, really get them while chipping them down the whole time. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the main plan. Yeah. So you you get back on turning point two, and then on turning point three, you go up there, go up again. Yeah. yeah. I think recon actually does help a lot for that strategy if you're able to keep enough yeah. models alive because it's very, very easy to score plant transponder and recover item if you're playing very cagey. Yeah. And you can keep, you know, five models of four APL alive. Yes. That's the main plan. I'm I'm not hiding. That's the main plan. Yeah. yeah if you gotta hide, you gotta hide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um and you can even sacrifice one raver to score uh, eliminate guards on turning point two if you need. So any two to one trade, if you are getting away two two good models, it's fine. And you can have use of the Omni Scrammer to do that kind of things. But other than that, you just want to shoot twice and then go back to conceal, the score, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Don't die, pretty much. If you if you are going to risk a marine for taking one shot, uh, you have to rethink that again because that suit ca that can really fluff because they are so bad at shooting. Not bad, but they are not unreliable. not not yes, unreliable. So yeah. 
you know, this is a lot of good tactics experience on a, one of these popular teams right now, but we've got a different niche tactics topic for the day, right, Jason? That we absolutely do. Niche tactics. There's been quite a few people that have been trying to tough it through playing the Hearth King. It sounds like you might have some some secret weapons, some cool techniques that maybe our listeners would enjoy, uh, some tips and tricks to play the Hearthkin more effectively. Okay, yeah, yeah, I have been playing them for a little now. And yeah, I have some some tech that I can share. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting hearing the Spanish tier list because you put them at an A, right? Yeah, I think they are A. Yeah, yeah sure. we have a couple of guys on our Discord, you know, the Just Another Kill Team Discord mm-hmm. that have that are big Dwarf fans because Dwarves inspire a lot of fans, but they have been struggling much more. So I was curious, you know, outside of the obvious stuff like Move Dash with the unwieldy AP2 gun, yep. you know, what other what other key strats have you found that really, you know, you found success on that where you push them to an A tier? So the thing is with Dwarves, uh, you are going to struggle uh, reaching points. But right now you have two operatives that can move seven inches and take in one point. And that's super cool. Like the, the one with the axe on the uh, Loctar uh, can reach pretty much every point on the, on the map. So you can use that. Also, you have like uh, on the Grenadier, the Grenadier shooting on choose is something that you need to recon. And the Grenadier with the little, nan- little nano mine are something like really, really powerful right now. And it's all about uh, setting up, uh, we call it in Spain, double dips. So you can kill two models in one in one hit. With the, the, ancestor, the ancestors are watching. If you stop using it to move that skill or to use the sniper or stuff like that, and you use it to charge with a, with a normal dude and then shoot uh, again, there is so much you can do. Because the, the, with the um, grudge tokens, people are start, are, are I start to just dying all the time because the damage input is is going bananas, like so 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 highly increase with the with the, with the grudge tokens, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you get a lot of knives. I play I play a lot of knives. I, I say people disregarding knives, play knives. Knives are good. <laughs> um, use it. Use them. Yeah, four attacks on fours, three five, lethal five is just like a b- little baby power weapon. But when you can get the yeah. first couple grudges, it means that your first yeah. charge can probably reliably kill eight wound, even ten yeah. wound models, right? If you can get a handful of crits. So the, the thing is, even if you get a- against any eight goons models, if you get charged, you can most of the time at least give something back. So you give back uh, three goons and a grudge token. And then any other of your dwarves with this uh, knife can charge that that dude and then shoot if you want, killing without taking any damage back, pretty much. So they are brilliant. Like so, they are really good. So you're having basically the front line that goes to grab the points be the yeah. uh, charge bait or the shooting bait, so that other people behind them can counter punch. Yeah, and the gunners get knives too. Like everybody gets a knife. Not the heavy. Not the not the heavy gunner. But all the others get a knife. Anyone that can charge, fight, shoot is getting a yes. knife, is what you're saying. Pretty much, yeah. So not the models that I get like really back, like the I think it's the Loctar. The ones that the one that gives you re- rerolls, mm-hmm. I don't use that much to to charge. So that and the comms can um It's the Cognitar, the robot. The Cognitar. robot gives you the gives you the strategic ploy ability, and then the locator is the one that stalls your opponents out. So he's I, kind of disposable because you can move him up I don't for use, no cover. I don't use the Loctar too much, to be honest. And, but I use the other, the Cognitar, quite a lot. So the Cognitar and the comms stay on the back. So they sometimes get a knife, sometimes don't. But yeah, uh, all the others get a knife and go into charge shooting. And also I use quite a lot the, um, the auto calibrators. Because they are so good, especially into the dark, so so good. Because you can shoot guards without um, ballistic uh, skill decrease, which is pretty good. And also you can get revive with one gun and still shooting on on threes, which is brilliant. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Because the medic can save a dwarf, and that dwarf can still yep. shoot at full power at with an auto calibrator. Yeah. yeah. I assume you always you're always taking the lugger, so that you can always get the five extra points. Of always. Yep. yep. So, because it sounds like you're trying to run, you know, seven to eight knives. 
the, <laughs> as much as you can, really. Yeah. I use also the um, the shovel to my my own barricade, so I can uh, traverse them with ease. Other than that, yeah, that, that's all you need, really. Knives, shovel, and and some calibrators. Really playing to the dwarven counterpunch strength, depending on your three up saves and your eight wounds to really get you through the worst of your enemy fire so that you can yep. chip away and then get the big dunk in. I think the call the first of the ancestors or uh, whatever it's called, the ancestors are watching, having that mm -hmm. lining up for two for ones. I think that's actually a really good point for players who are struggling because you can do it for a fun, you know, cheeky shot, but maybe the cheeky shots are not as valuable as one dwarf getting two, yep. two kills. And also because a lot of people doesn't uh, expect two dwarves to move so much. Because then you can move five inches, three inches with the dash, and then toss a grenade that can hit like three or four models of them. Yeah. And generally when you're doing that, you're using proximate firepower so that your grenadier is at yes. hitting on a two up for the big, yeah. his big explosion, which yeah, is like the... For listeners who don't know, because, you know, I don't know these profiles off the top of my head. <laughs> the grenadier have, has got the... They have C8. a two four, two four yeah. grenade and four six grenade. Yeah, yeah, the four six uh, blast one versus yes. you know the re like a normal frag grenade, but no, it's not a normal frag grenade. It's better, right? It's it's two four. It's yeah. two four instead of two three. Yeah, the gravitic yeah. concussion grenade is four attacks on threes, two four, and if you're hitting on twos, much more consistent, especially on mm -hmm. in the dark where I'm sure that gets a little bit of extra play. And yeah, then yeah. the other one is blast one, but AP one and you know range four, so much closer to the navy grenadier. Yes, it's pretty much the same profile with but with blast one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, most of the time it's all about uh, when and where you spend the, the ancestors are, are watching and where are you placing your uh, grudge tokens. Because right now, the grudge tokens, you can put it uh, every turning point. You can put, put it one, which is brilliant, to be honest. And then you can do a lot of damage to that, to that model. So, yep. Yeah. So you've been finding that the buffs to the hearth can definitely push them up to viability for you. Or yeah. for, even for Spanish players in general. Are there other Spanish players who have been finding success on Hearthcan, or are you kind of blazing yeah. a path on your own right now? Yeah, at least there are two or three good players playing Hearthcan. Like, not winning tournaments, but 3-1 or 4-1, something like that. So, yeah. Good, good, good records, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you see any differences in the, how, in the way they are playing Hearthcan compared to the way that, you know, you're playing Hearthcan that so you can recall? We discuss a lot about how to play. They use uh, ropes way more than I do because most of the time on the maps I played, the Vantage are not so Vantage, if you mind the expression, because they are just... Not looking uh, at anything. Yes, useful. Uh, useless, sorry. Yeah. No, it's good. Like Being able to adjust your, your loadouts on mm -hmm. equipment or even just your operative loadout to the board is a really, really big part of being super competitive. It really is, yeah. And with 15 equipment points and lots of one equipment, <laughs> <laughs> lots of one EP equipment, I guess the Hearthkin are that much harder compared to the average. Yeah. The good thing about Hearthkin is like is they get to score tag ops really good. Like they are super good at scoring tag ops right now. Yeah, I think I was talking to Eric, uh, who played played them at the Goonhammer Open. He did pretty well with them. I think okay. a mostly mostly positive record, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. He was mentioning that the um, the ancestor, the pain tokens, you know, are not that hard to, or not the pain tokens, the grudge tokens are mm -hmm. not that hard to score, just because you give out so many of them now yeah. compared to before. So you're basically playing recon with a really strong defensive profile who can shoot well. So if they come to deal with your recover item, you just blast them off the point. Yes, that's pretty much it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, for plant transponder or, you know, Vantage or whichever other one you're trying to do, you just play the positional game until you can score them. They have a really good uh, tactical ploy that they that allows them to score one um, one mission action before they die. So they get super efficient. Uh, and then you can plant a transponder with that mission action. That's something that I keep playing against uh, shooty teams. I keep playing that like all the time. Yeah, you just run a dude up into a weird spot. They're like, ah, I got a yeah. free kill. And you're like, all right, worth it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. I think those are those are good tips because I think they've been struggling a lot against maybe elites. Do you have any tips for, you know, the elite matchup? Elites shouldn't be so difficult, to be fair, because you can put so many grudge tokens that you can eliminate any elite. And you have, like, really good guns against them. All your gunners are brilliant. The axe guy is brilliant against them. I don't know. Uh, even your... P1 rifles are really good against Elite. 
with Glutch tokens. So I think the elites are really good um, teams for us. Like we don't struggle that much against them. We struggle against commandos and that stuff. Commando. So well, every everybody struggles against commandos yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right now. But yeah. other than that, commandos, Chao schooled, that things. The, the the normal hard matchups in the current meta. Yeah, still you can do a lot of you can do a lot like you can um, you can win that matchups even that matchups yeah 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 no I think those are those are good points I had not thought about some of those things for Hearthkin granted I have not been looking at them uh, very much so it's good to hear some successful notes Ancest mm -hmm. doing the ancestor two for one I assume that's much much harder against Space Marines but it seems yeah. like you against Space Marines you're totally fine having a two for one trade a couple times while chipping down because yes. by the time you get to the last guy the grudge token should be stacked up and you should just be able to delete the last guy yeah yeah like and, and any anybody can kill a marine with enough grudge tokens on him yeah with enough crits even the nurgle marines will go down yes. yeah right it sounds like sounds like that's a that's a good that's a good spot for us to cap it off on yeah jason i think so yeah we we hit on all the the big things here um was there anything else that you wanted to shout out ace any uh final call outs anything like that your like, podcast uh, oh yeah i have a podcast yeah uh, <laughs> yeah you know you're writing on goonhammer come on ace i yeah i i I, <laughs> I read with you in, in hammer yeah so i have a podcast that is called kill team mercenarios is in spanish right now and I am writing that good hammer. I am trying. I, I I have been on vacation, but I will be back uh, writing something about the Warhammer Worlds and about our own competition in Spain, about the Ibericon finals. So expect to hear from me uh, soon enough. I would say <laughs> very soon. <laughs> very soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, as for for my part, you know, anyone who's listening who wants to come to the New York Open, November fourth, fifth, please sign up. <laughs> um, it'll help. It'll help. Uh, you know, stop driving me so insane. <laughs> so, are, are any of you going to Atlanta? Right uh, there are three New York player or two two New York players going. Not me at the moment. I'm you know I'll compete in Nova this weekend. We'll see how it goes. Just uh, I'm just going for fun, trying out the Pathfinders in the dark because okay. why not? Okay, they yeah. seem really like really fun. Yeah, I mean they've always been good on open, so you know you get that. And then on in the dark now they are interesting. Mm -hmm. Because you can definitely set up for turn two a lot better than you were able to before. Because you know, when we were playing, I had a plan, but I was like, oh, there's no way for me to actually execute the plan. There's just I just <laughs> eat up I just eat up way too many actions on turn one, opening doors, yep. and kind of like shuffling around. So it's yeah. nice to be able to have a, like a guard action that is not wasted. So yeah, yes, I'm excited to play them. Yeah. What about you, Jason? Last thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, not really anything for me. Just kind of chilling out in the meantime uh getting ready for a couple local events and uh looking forward to playing more kill team once work calms down for me mm -hmm. yeah. and uh you know in case anyone makes it all the way to the end asa will have the secret word for today's podcast be ibericon i think that's the to organization you were saying yes yeah ibericon ibericon league is the is the name of the all the whole thing yeah Okay, yeah. If someone comes in and tries to spell that, we'll give you guys a discount code to our sponsor for the show, uh, you know, Luster's Workshop, friend of the pod. But thanks for coming on, Ace. It's been fun. Thank you. Thanks a million for having me. I am, I am really, it was really good to, to have some communication with the estates community. And I love you guys, as usual. And whenever you want a Spanish guy to, to be here, I am more than glad to be. So, yeah. Thanks for coming on, and thank you listeners for listening all the way until the end. See you next time.